for some time now, we've taken the route of critical biblical scholarship. We've been looking at things from a scholarly point of view, an archaeological point of view, and we are making arguments based on that. And in that realm, we're dealing with facts. We're dealing with data, uh, things that you can prove. And I believe that is the way to go when you want to prove something, when you want to prove your case. I think all civilizations, all cultures will use this method that we have been using for a while now to substantiate the claims that we make. I know that we've, we've been bombarded, we've heard so many lectures on Deuteronomy 28 talking about the um, transatlantic slave trade. And with that prophecy, as we are told, we can conclude that it's talking about um, the Hebrew people, the Hebrew Israelites, those who migrated to the coast of West Africa, those who were put on the slave ships, that is the people that is talking about, you know, and you can see, here, yeah, see, um, who does this fit? Who does this fit? Who does this fit? That has been the language that we've been bombarded with so much um, when it comes to trying to substantiate that we are the people of the book. I want to do something. Take this same premise and look at the other side of the coin. Who does it fit means that someone else is claiming to be who they are not. That is the argument. Yeah. So we have two people. We have the Jewish people who say they are the real people. And then we have the Hebrew people who are saying, I know you are fake. We are the real people. And the argument that the Hebrews are using is, see, who fits the curses? Who fits the curses? Did you want It prophesied about us. I'm going to play the devil's advocate. And I'm going to go with that trend of thought. Deuteronomy 28 is talking about the transatlantic slave trade. It's prophecy. Let's tread that line. Let's toe that line. But this time, the flip side. I'm going to make the same argument for the Jews. At the end of the class, I want you to table both prophecies. However, it's both supposed prophecies. However, it is, ta um, it, it is presented on the Hebrew side and then see which of them, if you were supposed to judge, would say that, you know what? This has more evidence than this. This is my goal today. Again, I don't subscribe to prophecy being used to prove identity, not at all. It's a dangerous game. So I'm going to say what I'm going to do again. I'm going to agree with the Hebrew Israelites that Deuteronomy 28 is talking about a transatlantic slave trade, which is used to prove that we are the people of the book. Okay. There is a... a uh, and on the side to the coin, we have the Jewish people who are saying that they are the people of the book. Can I be Jewish today? I'm not. But can I be Jewish today and use the same argument that the Hebrew Israelites are using, prophecy, to argue that no, we actually are the people of the book? That is my goal today. And then you get to determine. If you were supposed to choose, which one would you go for? What am I going to use as my proof, my evidence? I'm going to use the Torah. I'm going to use the Tanakh. I'm going to use the oral tradition, the Talmud, the Mishnah. I'm going to use the Zohar. I'm going to use Gematria. 
I'm going to use everything that is used to make the claim on the Hebrew Israelite side. I'm going to employ all of that and I'm going to make the same argument on the other side. And then you get to choose. So, um, I want to get that clear in my head. What you, you're trying to prove, are you trying to prove that the Jews that are saying they're Jews are Jews? Based on... Saying? Yes, based on the kind of arguments that the Hebrew Israelites make. Yes, that's what I'm going to. So what I'm going to present to Cynthia, who is new to this movement, is that two people are making a claim. One person is using prophecy. I'm going to present a prophecy from the other side, table it before you, and then you get to choose maybe who has a better claim. I don't know, but I'm so dead. Okay. I don't subscribe to both of them. I'm just presenting it. So that when we say certain things without knowing the other side of the coin, we stop because we shoot ourselves in the foot. The only way to prove this is what we've been doing for the past how many years? History, archaeology. Critical scholarship, else you'll be in trouble. What we're going to talk about, if you can see my screen, I, this is the audio for it. These are the PowerPoints. I taught it or I presented it in 2014. Um, it, it was a group of pastors who wanted me to um, go through the biblical text with them. So I, I did a course. It was called Rediscovering Emet. Emet is truth in Hebrew, Rediscovering Truth. And I presented this to them because they came with so much prophecy. Um, and I had to put it in perspective that it's, it's a bit dicey if you're going to use that to say that we are the people of the book. Okay. So let's go back to 2014, see what we can get from there. Two groups of people make almost the same claim. But they use two different angles to make the claim. Two group of people who have both experienced a form of exile. One person makes the claim based on what happened to them, what is happening to them from the perspective of curses. The other group is going to make a claim based on the perspective of a promise. I repeat that, it's critical. One group focuses on the negative, curses. That wasn't spoken to the person who the promise is given to, Abraham. The other group bases its claim on a promise given to a patriarch. Do you get the two points, the, the, the two views? and how different they are. I am going to use promise given to a patriarch to make my argument today. Brother Basil, it's a, yes. it's a bit yes. like when the, ba when the babies were presented to Solomon. You're Solomon today, are you? And there's two babies. Yes, yes. Oh. that's it. I like that. I like that. I'm Solomon and the two babies, the Jewish people and the Hebrew people. <laughs> and they're both saying. Okay, that's they're my both saying. Okay, so I'm going to listen to what they're saying and we get to make the judgment. Okay, okay. cool. So you know the Hebrew Israelite angle. Now, let me present this. I'm not Jewish, but today I'm going to wear the Jewish hat and see if I can show you the other side of the coin. Let's go down memory lane. Genesis 12, you'd hear how he said to Abraham, go forth from your land and from your birthplace and from your father's house 
to the land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will aggrandize your name, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you. Abraham went as Yudevave had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. Let's move on to verses 7. And Yudevave appeared to Abraham, and he said, Pay attention to this. To your seed, I will give this land. The land of Israel, the land of Canaan, which later has become the land of Israel. And I'm, I'm, I'm basing this off purely theological. Okay. The land of Canaan is promised to Abraham's descendant. To your seed, I will give this land. Okay, I'm going to follow this blessing in my demonstration. This is what I'm going to chase. I'm not chasing curses. I'm chasing the blessing. Okay, we seem to have forgotten the blessing and we so focus on the curse. All right, so Abraham's descendants the Jews, in parentheses, okay, you know where I'm going. I'm not a Jew. I'm just making arguments. They are promised the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. Genesis 32. So I am looking at a wave of Jews going into exile and coming back into the land. Follow me. And Laban rose early in the morning and kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them. And Laban went and returned to his place. And Jacob went on his way. Jacob went into an exile. He's left exile and he's coming back into the land of Israel, the land of Canaan. And Jacob went on his way, and angels of God met him. And Jacob said, when he saw them, this is the camp of God. And he named the place Mahanaim. Jacob sent angels ahead of him to his brother Esau, to the land of Seir, the field of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, so shall you say to my master, to Esau, Thus said your servant Jacob, I have surgeoned, he's gone on an exile, with Laban, and I have tarried until now. And I have acquired oxen and donkeys, flocks, manservants, maidservants. And I have sent to tell this to my master to find favor in your eyes. The angels returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother, to Esau, and he is also coming towards you. And 400 men are with him. Jacob became very frightened and was distressed. So he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the cattle and the camels into two camps. And he said, if Esau comes to one camp and strikes it down, and remain, the, the remaining camp would escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac, Yudevavhe, who said to me, return to your land. He is an exile, he should return and to your birthplace, and I will do good to you. I have become small from all the kindness and from all the truth that you have rendered your servant. For with my staff, I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Now deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him, lest he come and strike me and strike a mother with children. There's a siege, Laban means white, correct? It can be white, yes. What do we see here? The first time the Jews 
are returning from exile to the land of Israel, the promised land, Esau tries to stop them. Jacob and his sons, the Jews, let's call them Jews today. Their first attempt in exile to come back to the land promised, somebody stops them or somebody tries to stop them. Who was it? Esau. When was the second time? The Hebrews, I can't, I've said Hebrews for so long, I, I, it's on my tongue. Let me change that. The Jews, they are living out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They are going on their way to the land promised. They are going to stop by the mountain and talk to the deity and then head on to the land of Israel, the land of Canaan. Who shows up? Amalek. We read, Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So Moshe said to Joshua, pick men for us and go out and fight against Amalek. We know what transpired. Because of time, I won't read everything. Okay. So the second time, the Jews are returning from exile in Egypt to the land of Israel, the land promised. Amalek comes to stop them. Who was Amalek? Genesis 36 tells us that Amalek is actually from Esau. Ada bore Eliphaz to Esau and Basmath. Boruel. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Oman, Zepho, all of that. And Timna was a concubine to Eliphaz, son of Esau, and she bore to Eliphaz Amalek. So what? A grandson of Esau? Okay. The biblical text hated so much what Amalek did. So this is what it tells us. The book of Deuteronomy 25. You shall remember what Amalek did to you on the way when you went out of Egypt. How he happened upon you on the way and cut off all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore, it will be when you'd have Ave, your God, grant you respite from all your enemies around you in the land which you'd have Ave, your God, gives to you as an inheritance to possess, that you shall obliterate the remembrance of Malik from beneath the heavens. You shall not forget. It is a command to destroy Amalek from the surface of this earth. What exactly did Amalek do? The Jewish commentators, Rashi, what did Amalek do? Let's go to Genesis um, story. Deuteronomy 25, we're going to go to verses 18. I'm going to show Rashi's commentary. And Rashi is going to tell us something. It is Deuteronomy 25. I'm coming to verses 18, where Rashi comments on how he happened upon you on the way and cut off all the stragglers at your rear. Cut off, Rashi comments on it. He says, this refers to the fact that Amalek cut off the members of the male Jews where they had been circumcised 
and cast them up provocatively towards heaven, exclaiming to God, you see, what good has your commandment of circumcision done for them? This is what Rashi tells us, the Jewish commentator on the on, on, on the on, on Humash tells us what Hamalek does. He's getting it from the oral tradition, Tahuma 9. Let's go there and read it for ourselves. I told you the sources I'm going to be using. And I, I didn't want to take screenshots and put it in, in my PowerPoint. I want us to go there and then we can read it. Okay, let's go down here. I'm going to start here. Joshua ben Levi and Rabbi Johanan said, What did the house of Amalek do to Israel? They cut off their pennies and flung them heavenward. As they said, This is what you have chosen. Take for yourself what you have chosen. You see it for yourself. Okay. Put that in your spirit because it's going to be very important. Amalek hates circumcision. Put that in your spirit, please. So we have a command to wipe off Amalek because of what they did to Israel. And we've seen what the Jewish sources say. They did. Oral tradition, the Talmud, Mishnah, Gemara. Okay. Let's take it that is a Jewish source. No, no, no. Wrong position. Let's take it that it is our source. It is our oral tradition. Okay. It belongs to the Hebrew Israelites. Let's take it that way. You see why I'm taking that stance. So let's clear this up. The second time the Jews are returning from exile to the land of Israel, that is the promised land, Amalek come to stop them. The Bible makes it a command to totally wipe out Amalek because of this act. Why? Amalek seems to hate circumcision, according to the Jewish sources. Okay. The third attempt. When was the third attempt when the Jews are trying to come back into the land or about to come back into the land from exile and they are stopped or an attempt is made to stop them? We know of the Babylonian exile. The Persians come and they conquer the Babylonians. There's a prophecy that at the completion of 70 years of Babylon, I'll remember you. And I'll fulfill my good word towards you to restore you to this place. So after this time, the Persians took over. Now there is an attempt. When the exile was about to be over, a man comes on the scene. Who knows his name? His name is Haman. Follow me carefully. In Esther chapter 3, we read, After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamidata, the Agagat. Agagat. According to the Jews, Haman was a descendant of the king of Amalek, of Agag. Where are they getting it from? First Samuel 15. And Saul smote Amalek from Havilah until you come to Shur, which is in front of Egypt. And he sized Agag, the king of Amalek, alive. And he completely destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So this is where they are getting the idea that Haman is from Amalek. They may up, they may be up to something, upon something. Okay, 
What did Haman want to do to the Jews? We read in Esther 3. And Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and separate among the peoples throughout all the provinces of your kingdom. And their laws differ from those of every people, and they do not keep the king's laws. It is therefore of no use for the king to let them be. If it pleases the king, let it be written to destroy them. Huh? Almost time to come to leave exile, to come back to the land. Amalek shows up again. And now weigh out 10,000 silver talents into the hand of those who perform the work to bring it to the king's treasuries. Okay. So we know what happened. I don't want to read the whole book of Esther. But Haman gets his ways. Verses 13. A letter shall be sent by the hand of the to all the king's provinces to destroy, kill, cause to perish all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women. Okay. We've seen a pattern. What actually happened? Esther verse 6. And the king said, who is in the court? I'm taking for granted that you know this. So this is Haman coming to the king's court um, to come in, you know, say that, hey, he, he's, he's built a gallow and he wants Mordecai a hand. So he shows up and um, the king says this. And the king said, who is in the court? And Haman had come to the outside court of the king's house to petition the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said to him, Behold, Haman is standing in the court. And the king said, Let him enter. And Haman entered. And the king said to him, What should be done to a man whom the king wishes to honor? And Haman said to him, Whom would the king wish to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, a man whom the king wishes to honor, let them bring the royal raiment that the king wore and the horse that the king rode upon and the royal crown should be placed on his head. And let the raiment of the horse be delivered into the hand of one of the king's most noble princes and let them dress the man whom the king wishes to honor and let them parade him on the horse in the city square and announce before him, so shall be done to the man whom the king wishes to honor. And the king said to Haman, Harry, take the raiment and the horse as you have spoken and do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits in the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that you have spoken. Oh, and Haman took the raiment and the horse and he dressed Mordecai and paraded him in the city square and announced before him, so shall be done to the man whom the king wishes to honor. Now pay close attention. And Mordecai returned to the king's gate, and her man rushed home, mourning, and with his head covered. Why is her man mourning? Mourning is, <laughs> is out of place. What happened? He wanted to go get Mordecai hanged. It did not happen. What happened was that he paraded Mordecai in the, in the, in the streets. So what has mourning got to do with it? Well, I told you the salt is I'm going to be quoted. The oral tradition tells us that the reason why Haman is mourning because he's mourning over the death of his daughter. He's mourning, that's why mourning is used. He's mourning, he's grieving over the death of his daughter. Let's read why that is. I won't tell you because I know it. I want us to read it so that it doesn't look like I'm telling you stories. Okay, let's bring the source. Hope you can. Let's click here. Let me put my sauce in, and then we come to the Megillah. Okay. 
Let's come here. Let me... The verse states, And he proclaimed before him, That shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. As Haman was taking Mordecai along the street of Haman's house, Haman's daughter was standing on the roof and saw the spectacle. She thought to herself that the one who is riding on the horse must be her father and the one walking before him must be Mordecai. She then took a chamber pot. A chamber pot is a pot that has feces or urine, full of feces and cast its content onto the head of his father, whom she mistakenly took as Mordecai. When Haman raised his eyes in disgust afterwards and looked up at his daughter, she saw that he was her father. In her distress, she fell from the roof to the ground and died. Okay, that is what the oral tradition tells us. Put that in your spirit, please. So, what do we have? Haman is mourning because his daughter committed suicide. Don't forget this. We go on. Now, Haman's plan has been found out. The king, Ahasuerus, comes to um, Esther. And is going to ask Esther what she wants. And the king arose in his fury from the wine feast to the orchard garden. And Haman stood to beg for his life of Esther, of Queen Esther. For he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. Then the king returned from the orchard garden to the house of the wine feast. And Haman was fallen on the couch upon which Esther was. And the king said, Will you even force the queen with me in the house? The word came out of the king's mouth, and they covered Haman's face. Then said Habona, one of the chamberlains before the king, Also, behold, the gallows that Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke well for the king, standing in Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on it. And they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger abated. Okay. Now, the king is given, gave Esther, the Jews, the permission to defend themselves and then to also kill um, anyone who comes to, who wants to do them harm. Let's go to Esther 9. And the Jews smoked all their enemies with a stroke of the sword and with slaying and destruction. And they did to their enemies as they wished. And in Shushan, the capital, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. And then we have the names of Haman's sons. Let's go to verses 10. The 10 sons of Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the adversary of the Jews, they slew. Don't forget that. They killed them. But on the spoils, they did not lay their hands. On that day, the number of those slain in Shushan, the capital, came before the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, In Shushan, the capital, the, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman. In the rest of the king's provinces, what have they done? Now, what is your petition? And it shall be granted you. And what is your request? And it shall be done. Listen to Esther carefully. And Esther said, If it please the king, let tomorrow too be granted to the Jews to do as today's decree 
and let them hang her man's ten sons on the gallows. What is the issue with this request? Let tomorrow too be granted to the Jews to do as today's decree and let them hang Hamas ten signs on the gallows. What is wrong with this request? Rabbi? Madam Alita. Rabbi? Weren't they already dead? They were already dead. It makes no sense. What he is asking, what do you want, Queen Esther? Oh, I have a request. If it please the king, let tomorrow too be granted to the Jews to do as today's decree, and let them hang Haman's ten sons on the gallows. Interesting, difficult request, because... Haman's ten sons are already dead. Put that in your spirit. So the third time the Jews are returning from exile to the land of Israel, the promised land, Amalek comes to stop them again. That's the third time. Awesome. So what have I demonstrated? I've used the Torah. I've followed a trend. Promised land given to Abraham's children. The Jews are going the first time Esau stops them. They, they attempt to do the second time Amalek stops them. They go again. Haman, who is from Amalek, stops them three times. Fourth attempt. This is where it gets interesting. Okay. When again was another attempt? Remember, I'm talking about the Jews. I'm making an argument. The flip side of the coin. In the 1880s, a movement began in Europe called Zionism. It was a movement to bring Jacob's children back to the land of Israel, the promised land. What happened? A wave of immigration began from Europe into the land of Israel. After a long time of exile, they say 2000. We have this Balfour Declaration of 1917, announcing that is the British government, its support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. 1917. In 1933, a man emerged on the scene of history and engineers an ideology to destroy Jacob's children. Who was this man? Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Okay. Follow carefully. In the book of Psalms, 140, it says, O youth have of hate, do not grant the desires of the wicked. Do not let his thoughts succeed, for they are constantly haughty. The Talmud tells us that this refers to Gemania of Edom. Before I go on, the Talmud was written approximately, what, 1700, 1800 years ago, 4th century, the year 400. Mr. Jason, I, I hope I'm correct. I believe I'm correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. 
At the time of the writing of the Talmud, there was no country called Germany. Germany became a nation in 1870. But the Talmud commenting on this verse tells us something. Let me bring the source. Let's read it for ourselves. I don't want to be telling you something that is not there. Okay. Remember what I'm quoting here. O oh Lord, do not grant the desires of the wicked. Do not let his thoughts succeed, for they are constantly hardy. The Talmud is going to tell us, or the oral tradition is going to tell us. Here, let me bring it here. And Rabbi Yitzhak also said, What is the meaning of that which is written? Grant not, O oh Lord, the desires of the wicked. Feather not his evil device, so that they not exalt themselves, Selah. Jacob said before the Holy One, Blessed be he, Master of the universe, grant not to the wicked Esau the desires of his heart, as he wishes to destroy us. Okay? Ah. Uh, it was this, I want to highlight this. Further not his evil device. That is, do not remove the muscle, the bit, that constrains him and prevent him from breaking out and gathering further strength. He says this is a reference to Germania of Edom. That is Germany which is near the land of Edom, that is Rome, as if the Germans will go forth, they will destroy the entire world. This is what the Talmud writes, or the oral tradition writes. I'm arguing that I'm, I'm accepting that the oral tradition is ours. It's a Hebrew Israelite book. I'm, I'm accepting it. So, our oral tradition is telling us something about Gemamia of Edom and is saying that it's Germany. But, like I said, Germany did not exist when the Talmud was supposedly written. Can we prove that the Germans maybe called themselves Germania or they had something like that? Let's see. In 1937, Hitler's architect, Albert Speer, was given the task of transforming Berlin from the sprawling metropolis that it was into Germania, the gleaming new capital of the greater German world empire, the centerpiece of the civilized world. I'm getting this from history today. Okay. Let's go back. I'm going to give more evidence. He continues. And Rabbi Hama Bahanina said, there are 300 young princes with crowns tied to their heads in Gemami of Edom. There are 300 crown prince in Gemami of Edom. And there are 365 chieftains in Rome. Italy. Every day these go out to battle against those, and one of them is killed, and they are preoccupied with appointing a new king in his place. There are 300 crown princes of Edom. That is what we are told of Gamamia, sorry, of Edom. 
This is what, what we are told. Okay, what do we know historically? The oral tradition is telling us that there seemed to be a fight, Gamamia, with a place called Rome, which is Italy. Well, in the Middle Ages, there was constant wars. That is 30 years war, the 100 year war. It was a fight against Germany, Russia, and Rome. Germany against the Holy Roman Empire. Why were they fighting? Because, according to the oral tradition, if they get together, they will be more dangerous. That is why they are fighting. In World War II, however, Germany united with Italy. The first country he made a treaty with was Italy. October 25th, 1936, Germany and Italy entered into a treaty of friendship in which they pledged to pursue a common foreign policy. The only treaty he did not break was with Italy, which is Rome. He broke the treaty with Russia, Poland, Czechoslovakia. Right after the war, the Allied nations divided Germany into two, East and West Germany. Because according to the oral tradition, if they united, they will destroy the world. The oral tradition says there are 300 crown princes in Gamamia of Edom. Is that accurate? In 1350, the German monarchy became purely elective, further weakening the power of the empress. By 1500, Germany would be a patchwork of some 300 independent states. 300 crown prince of Germania of Edom. I'll state it again. When the Talmud was written, there was no Germany. There was no Hitler. There was none of this. I'm being Jewish today. I'm giving receipts, I'm making some arguments. I'm backing it up historically. Okay, let's move on. We found out that Amalek hates circumcision. Okay, that is one of the traits of Amalek. Let's see what Hitler says from his own mouth. Let me bring it. I haven't even got into my solid point yet. Let me give you receipts. Bring this here. Let's look at this. Click here and I'll give you receipts and then we go to where I want to go. Get it inside Hitler's head. Let's read from here. Providence has ordained that I should be the greatest liberator of humanity. I am freeing man from the restraints of an intelligence that has taken charge, from the dirty and degraded self mortification of a false vision called conscience and morality, and from the demand of a freedom and independence which only a very few can bear. The Ten Commandments have lost their validity Conscience. Conscience is a Jewish invention, a blemish like circumcision. And circumcision is a blemish. Amalek took it, according to the oral tradition, in the Sinai Desert, took this, um, the false kings of the Jews who are just circumcised and then tossed it up to God and said almost the same thing that Hitler is saying here. So the Jews use some of these to conclude that the Germans 
or the Nazis were the seed of Amalek. Because Amalek, according to their tradition, hates circumcision. Okay. Also, any questions till now? Before I go to where I want to hang my hat on. Actually, Rabbi, you could stop here because it's over. Um, <laughs> they, listen, it's it's crazy. I I never knew this part, man. This is nuts. So they have a they have a story just like we do, using the scriptures as well. Yes, but they also have a, a oral tradition from like five hundred years to a thousand years before that they're borrowing off of, saying that this is prophecy that's coming true. They got receipts Correct. too. Wow. Yes, solid receipts, solid. <laughs> so <laughs> let's go on. Okay, now we have a trial in Nuremberg. Hope you can see my screen. A trial takes place in the city called Nuremberg in Germany. They trialed the major Nazi war criminals. This trial was concluded in June 1946. In the year 1946, after the defeat of the Nazis, which is the seed of Amalek, according to the Jews, a trial took place in the city called Nuremberg in Germany. Now, after the trial and the verdict had come out, they did not know whether to shoot them or hang them. There was a debate about it. If you shoot them, you're giving them a, um, um, a soldier's death, but they trial them as criminals. So it was determined at the trial that 11 of the major Nazi criminals will hang. 11 of them would hang. Two hours before the execution, one committed suicide. His name was Hermann Guren. Hermann William Guren. This is it. The New York Times. Wednesday, October 16th. 1946. Gurin ends life by poison. Ten other hanged in Nuremberg prison for Nazi war crimes. Doomed men on gallows pray for Germany. Okay. Let me go back to my statement. Here. It was determined at the trial that 11 of the major Nazi criminals were hanged. Two hours before the execution, one committed suicide. My question is that, why did the person commit suicide? Why did the person commit suicide? Let's go to Esther. Esther said something. If it pleases the king, let tomorrow too be granted to the Jews to do as today's decree. Let the ten sons of Haman hang on the gallows. Wait. Haman is Amalek. The Nazis are Amalek according to Jewish tradition. How many children did Haman have? Eleven. What happened to the other one? She, she committed suicide, the daughter. <laughs> Do you see where I'm going? Esther asked for something that we did not understand because it made no sense. She says the same thing that happened today. Tomorrow, let the 10 sons of her man hang on the gallows. Wait, her man had 11 sons, 11 children. At Nuremberg, it was 11 people who were supposed to be hanged. 
Her man's, let's take it as her man's 11 children need to be had. One commits suicide just as her man's daughter commits a suicide. So if only 10 people who are put on the gallows, exactly what Esther asks for. Let the 10 sons of her man be hanged on the gallows. Okay, follow me. We're dealing with prophecy. The trial, the verdict, was concluded in June 1946. June 1946 is when the verdict was concluded. It's the Jewish year 5706. They were hanged. The execution took place October 16, 1946, which is the Jewish year 5707. Now, when you're writing the years in, in, in um, the Jewish years, you can truncate it just as you can tr truncate October 16, 1946. You can truncate it to 10, 16, 46. Day, day, month, month, year, year. With a Jewish calendar or the dates, this is how you truncate it. You don't have to bring the um, thousand column. You can remove the five and just do 707. So just as you can truncate our year, our date, and do 10, 16, 46, you don't have to write 1946. You can do the same thing with the Jewish year. Actually, that is how they write it. 707. Okay. Okay. Now, let's use some gematria. And our Zohar to prove something. This is Megillah Esther, the scroll of Esther. This is how it is written. I want you to focus on this part right here. Now, when you read the, the scroll, you would notice some small Hebrew alphabets. They're unique. You have <laughs> in the scroll three big ones and then three small ones. These are the names of Mordecai's sons in this list. You will notice a small tab here. There is a small shin here. There is a small Zion here. And then you have this oversized vav. This is what my focus is going to be. Okay? My focus here. So let me bring it here so that it's clear. Esther 9 7. This is what we're going to look at. In the three verses, naming the ten sons of Haman, there are three abnormally small Hebrew letters. They are written small for a reason. We see the small letter Tav in Pashan Data, that is one of the sons of Haman. And then we see the small letter Shin in Pamashta. And then we see the small letter Zion in Vajizata. Hmm, crazy names. Okay? All right. The Hebrew year 5707 is written as <laughs> Mr. Jason, are you there? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. It's solid. Solid. These small letters have a combined gematria of 707. I repeat that. When you take those small Hebrew alphabets in the names of these sons, they, they're not usual. They are written in very small sizes. When you take them and you do the gematria, 
you get 707. Why is this important? Let's go back. When did the execution take place? 707 on the Jewish calendar. And it happens that there is this sort of code in the names of Haman's ten sons that actually points us to the date that they're supposed to be hung. And then when you look at this oversized Vav, it has a value of six, five, seven, oh, seven. It's in the sixth millennium. I repeat it. 5707 falls in the sixth millennium. This is how the match works. You take the numerical values of the Hebrew alphabet and then you get numbers and then you interpret them. Six hundred thousand letters in the Torah. Only 23 are written, small or large. So, whoever wrote the Megillah, whatever Esther said, it seems there's a date that you can find in there as well. And the date matched when the ten sons of a man were hanged in Germany. Okay, <laughs> let's go on here. Esther said, if it please the king, let tomorrow too be granted to the Jews to do as today's decree. What does the oral tradition tell us about tomorrow? It tells us that there is a tomorrow that is now and a tomorrow which is later. Let me bring it up so that you don't think that I am making it up. Let me bring the source. Mm -hmm. Let me grab it here. And then put it here. And let us see what our tradition says. And it shall be when thy sons ask thee tomorrow. What is this? Sometimes tomorrow means the next day, and sometimes it means the time to come. So there is a tomorrow that is now, and a tomorrow which is later. Well, let's put some more data on it. October 16, 1946, when they were executed, fell on the 21st of Tishrei. What do we know about Tishrei in Jewish circles? Tishrei becomes a new year. When you move from um, 5706, when the verdict was given, and you get to 5707, you get to Tishrei. So Tishrei is seen as the new year. It becomes a new year when you get into Tishrei. In Jewish material, the day they were hung was Hoshana Rabbah. Hoshana Rabbah. What does the Zohar say about this day? Hosanna Hoshana Rapa. What does the Zohar say about this day? Let's find out. I'm going to copy this, come to my page, post it, and then we can read. It says sources of Hoshana Rapa. I'm going to scroll all the way down and we come to the Zohar. It tells us on the final night of Sukkot, the notes, that is the slips, the paper, the verdicts, go out from the palace to the king. The patakim. 
goes out from the palace to the king. On the seventh day of Sukkot, the world's judgment is completed and the Patakim go out from the palace to the king. He says, come and see. When judgment is awakened to the world, the Holy One of Blessing sits on the throne of judgment to judge the world. The day that they were hanged fell on Hoshana Rabbah. And according to Jewish sources, on this day is when Hashem sits on his throne to judge the nations. Hoshana Rabbah. Awesome. Now, in conclusion, Julius Streicher. How did the Jewish people get to know that this is what Esther was talking about? For a long time, they did not know how to interpret that verse. Let it be done today as it was done tomorrow. Let the ten sons of a man hang on the gallows. They did not understand why this lady is asking for dead people to be hung. Oh, who gives them the clue? One of Haman's sons, one of the sons of Hamalek, they interpret it. Let's read it for ourselves. I don't want to say something as if I'm just taking it from thin air. I'm going to bring it here and then we're going to read this one. Let me go ahead and make it big. Who you see on your screen is Julia Streicher. Let's go. The execution of Nazi war criminals. Defendant Julius Streicher, editor-in-chief of the venomous anti-Semitic Nazi paper, takes the stand during the Nuremberg trials. Streicher was sentenced to death by hanging. So there are the pictures of him. Let's go all the way down. I want to read Julius Streicher. What happened? Here we go. Julius Streicher made his melodramatic appearance at 12, 2 12 a.m. While his manacles were being removed and his bare hands bound, this ugly dwarfish little man wearing a threadbare suit and a well-worn bluish shirt buttoned to the neck but without a tie. He was notorious during his days of power for his flashy dress glanced at the three wooden scaffolds rising menacingly in front of him. Then he glanced around the room, his eyes resting momentarily upon the small groups of witnesses. By this time, his hands were tied securely behind his back. Two guards, one on each arm, directed him to number one gallows on the left of the entrance. He walked steadily the six feet to the first wooden step, but his face was twitching, okay? As the guard stopped him at the bottom of the steps for identification, formality, he uttered his piercing scream, Hail Hitler. The shriek sent a shiver down my back. As its echo died away, an American Colonel standing by the steps said sharply, Ask the man his name. In response to the interpreter's query, Streicher shouted, You know my name well. The interpreter repeated this request, and the condemned man yelled, Julius Streicher. As he reached the platform, Streicher cried out, Now it goes to God. He was pushed the last two steps to the mortal spot beneath the hangman's rope. The rope was being held back against a wooden rail by the hangman. Stryker was swung suddenly to the face. Sorry, Stryker was swung suddenly to face the witnesses and glared at them. Suddenly he screamed, Purim Fest, 1946. I repeat it again. Streicher was swung suddenly to face the witnesses and glared at them. 
Suddenly he screamed. Purim Fest, 1946. And then he writes the person writing. Purim is a Jewish holiday celebrated in the spring, commemorating the execution of Haman, ancient persecutor of the Jews described in the Old Testament. When he shouted this, the rabbis went to their books, brought up the book of Esther, and then they said, now we know what this means. Let tomorrow too be granted to the Jews to do as today's decree and let the 10 sons of Haman, the 10 Nazis, the 10 sons of Amalek, hang on the gallows. And then they say, who unlocked this mystery for us? None other but one of the sons of Amalek. Okay, I think I've presented enough data. I have used the Torah, the Tanakh, the oral tradition, Gamatia, the Zohar, history, to show you the claim from the other side of the coin. Two groups subscribe to prophecy, proving that they are the people of the book. You haven't had this side yet. Today you have. You've had the other side, I believe. Now, and if you put them next to each other and you're neutral, which would you say makes a better claim, has better proofs, has better receipts, has more receipts, has detailed receipts, however you want to examine it? Who do you say may be onto something? Again, I don't subscribe to any of them, both of them. I don't subscribe to prophecy being used to determine lineage, who a people is. But this is the other side of the coin, that those who are pushing this prophetic thingy haven't heard or don't know. So if you use Gematria, they also use Gematria. They can use Gematria. If you use historical account, they also do and can use historical account. If you use prophecy, they also and they can use that as well. This is the issue that we have. I've presented both to you. Now, you are well educated. Two determine who may be after something or if all of this is just nonsense.